good morning my dear students today the topic for our discussion is going to be a part of biotechnology it is this biotechnology we are discussing for the last two days what is biotechnology i have explained to you it is a application part of the genetics <clears throat> when the when we wanted to utilize the knowledge gained through the genetics to the welfare of the human being by improving the crops by improving the animals by improving the quality of the medicine to combat with the, the diseases coming to the man so when we are doing these things then it becomes automatically biotechnology now basically in biotechnology what we are doing we take in a chromosome a particular portion will be there which will be useful to the human kind that portion of the dna is removed and then it is put in a vector which is called as a vehicle through that vector it is uh, uh, transported or it is uh, transferred to an organism where it is required this is the fundamentals of biotechnology of course it uh, there are other aspects of biotechnology also for example tissue culture is there when uh, you take a single cell and then culture it then it becomes a tissue culture in in today's science the tissue culture has led to what is called as an organ culture there may be a situation when you will be able to do an organism culture also already the science has seen that dolly so a single a with the whole organism is a developed from a single cell it could be a vegetative cell or it could be a reproductive cell from both we are able to produce an organism today so these are all what are called as offshoots of biology now in our today's class we are going to discuss about what is called as a or dna that is a topic or dna what is a or dna or this is a recombinant dna when you take a particular dna and then combine it to the another dna post dna then that is what is called as a recombinant dna you have recombined a portion of one dna dna belonging to one organism into another organism so it is called as a recombinant dna fine so in, in um, which situations these or dnas are used one very good example i am taking <coughs> it is uh, happening in the gene transfer in the plants agrobacterium tumefaciens agrobacterium tumefaciens is a soil inhabiting bacterium <coughs> it it invades the crops like tomato sunflower brinjal cotton and then it causes a disease called crown gall disease okay so it causes which it invades the crops like tomato tomato means you tell me the binomials for these plants can you tell me tomato like a persicum versicola sunflower helianthus anis then brinjal solanum melangena and then cotton gossypium barbadens so these are all the botanical name the binomials of the plants the agrobacterium tumefaciens is attacking see whenever you come across the name of a particular plant or animal you try to understand or you try to learn the binomial for that now that makes the difference between you and the lower standard students okay by seeing a cat 
a third standard or a fourth standard boy will tell that it is a cat but you should be able to tell the zoological name of that if i am showing a mango to a child it will tell immediately mango but you should be able to tell that its name is a mangifera indica that makes the difference so you have to learn you learn the binomials of all the plants okay that's uh, that's that's uh, one 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 part of that so <coughs> agrobacterium tumefaciens is attacking the lycopersicum vesicala elianthazannes solanum melangena and then gossypium barbadense tricot so it causes the disease called crown gall disease you know gall galls is a um, in a, um bubble like structures bubble like structures which is a very hard in nature produced in the nodal portion or in the root in all the parts of the body it is being produced so it is a tumorous growth as indicated by the specific name to my patients this a tumor is a caused by ti plasmid it is produced by ti plasmid in this a pathogenic bacterium but not by the bacterial chromosome okay so this is the agrobacterium tumefaciens bacterium now this bacterium has got its own chromosome then it has got many plasmids also many plasmids it is having okay now this plasmid is called as a ti plasmid and that is carrying the genes for causing the disease okay so when i say that agrobacterium tumefaciens is causing a crown gall disease in the following plants the genes which are present in the agrobacterium tumefaciens is not responsible for that then which is responsible the genes which are present in the plasmid of agrobacterium tumefaciens and these plasmids are called as ti plasmids okay now it's very clear fine good a beautiful presentation see see this is the crown gall disease so it is a pro produced in the form of the wart like structures or uh, tumors produced in the nodal portion okay so this is the disease a crown gall disease so how to fight with this disease that's our idea the first step is to modify agrobacterium strains by removing the tumor inducing genes from the plasmid of the bacterium so i told you that this is the bacterium and it is containing the chromosome this chromosome is not responsible for causing the disease but the plasmids which are present in the agrobacterium is responsible so if you want to remove the tumor you remove this plasmid the matter is very simple see the first step is to modify the agrobacterium you make this agrobacterium tumefaciens by removing the tumor inducing genes from the plasmid of the bacterium either you can completely remove the plasmid but we don't do that we don't do that what we do we do only, we normally remove only the genes which are inducing the disease so that those genes are identified in the plasmid and these uh, uh, genes are removed from the plasmids when these genes are removed from the plasmids then this plasmid will not be able to cause a disease when the plasmid is not able to cause a disease the bacterium will also be not able to cause a disease because the regular normal dna present in the bacterium is not responsible okay now <coughs> remaining dna in the plasmid is called t dna so this is the plasmid and this plasmid is a containing the disease causing area and when you are removing this the remaining portion is called as a tRNA understand that very clearly okay 
So remaining DNA in the plasmid is called the tDNA. This is a tDNA which holds the desired foreign gene after splicing is introduced into the plant cell. Okay. So this plasmid is only good. It's a good plasmid. It is not causing any disease. If you are removing the disease causing genes from that plasmid. So if this tDNA which is a devoid of the disease causing portion of the DNA then it could be introduced into the plant cell after splicing that. No tumorous growth is formed as the TI gene from the plasmid has been deleted. Okay, this you are able to understand. Fine. How this is being done? This introduced tDNA along with the spliced desired foreign gene combines with the donor cell chromosome where it produces a copies of itself by migrating from one chromosomal position to another chromosomal to another. So, when it is going into the plant cell, when it is going into the plant cell, now after removing the disease causing area in the plasmid, if it is removed and then when it is injected, in the cell, in a plant cell, you have got the chromosomes. Now, these plasmidal genes are going and incorporating itself in the chromosomes of the plant. Okay? Then, that is able to produce a very good effect. That's what I told. This introduced a tDNA along with the spliced desired foreign gene combines with the donor cell chromosome where it produces a copies of itself by migrating from one chromosome position to the another. Such plants with desired tDNA integrated in their chromosomes are cultured, induced to multiply and differentiate to form the plantlets by tissue culture method. Okay. So, I, I hope you understand these things very easily. So, then this uh, tissue has to be, cultured, the chromosomes, the, the cells are to be cultured. Then they are induced to multiply. The cells will be multiplying and then they will differentiate. Finally, plantlets will be produced. These plantlets uh, will be able to, when they are transferred to the normal situation, see how the plantlets are uh, nurtured and then uh, made into the plants uh, that you would have studied in the tissue culture. See, when callus is formed, then uh, from that you produce the, what is known as the plantlets. Plant, uh, plantlets normally they will be produced inside the laboratory only. Inside the laboratory, in a well refrigerated condition, in an aseptic condition, the plantlet will be able to grow very fast, very beautifully it will be able to grow. But once the plantlets are transferred to the field, then only the problem comes. What problem? It is uh, all of a sudden transferred to a new situation. Temperature will be very high. All the other uh, environmental factors will be totally different from, for, for the plantlet. Because the plantlet is altogether completely totally experiencing a closet, a closed form of the environment which is amicable for the plantlets. But once the plantlets are transferred to the open area, then the survival rate becomes normally very, very uh, less. But still you can do it. In biotechnology, we do it. These uh, plantlets are cultured and then these uh, plantlets are uh, slowly they are acclimatized to the normal situation. All of a sudden we don't do that. Then the plantlets are uh, taken, then it is uh, put in a shade for a few days. After that, it is slowly shifted to another place where there will be a humidity will be there. And then finally, the plantlet is made hardened. This is called a hardening step. So you harden the plant to take up any environmental situation. The, the plantlets are hardened. And then finally, they are transferred to the open environment. Okay. So this is how we do. These plantlets are transferred. This is what I am telling. 
these platelets are transplanted to soil where they are allowed to express a foreign gene introduced into them. This recombinant DNA technology is accomplished by key tools. Okay, there are five tools are there. Five things are essential for that. What are the five things essential? Restriction enzymes. By restriction enzymes, they alone will be able to cut the desired genes. Restriction enzymes are of two types, namely exonucleases and endonucleases. Exonuclease will cut the gene from the open end and the endonuclease will cut a portion of the genes. A portion of the genes from within this particular limit or intermittently. So for this you need the restriction enzymes. Polymerases, you need enzymes. And then that is the enzymes required for cutting. Ligases. That, that which is uh, doing the business of a uh, pasting. Once they are cut off, they have to be rejoined. This uh, rejoining work is uh, done by ligases. Then you need vectors so, to carry it. Then you need the host organisms. So these are all the five things uh, needed. If this, uh, if any one is uh, missing, then you can't do this job. All the five are the most, most essential tools for the for carrying out this recombinant DNA technology. Okay, so I read once again. This recombinant DNA technology is accomplished by key tools, namely restriction enzymes, polymerase enzymes, ligases, vectors, and host organisms. Two restriction enzymes responsible for restricting the growth of the bacterial phage in E. coli were isolated. One of these added methyl group to DNA and the other cut DNA. Later was called restriction endonucleases. This endonuclease is responsible for cutting the DNA. Okay, so two enzymes were analyzed from E. coli. One is added methyl group to DNA. One is adding the methyl group to DNA and the other is doing the cutting business. This uh, enzyme which is uh, doing the business of a uh, cutting is uh, called as a restriction enzyme or and in the restriction enzyme it is a cutting, coming under the category called uh, endonucleases. Restriction enzymes belong to larger classes of enzymes and they are called nucleases. <coughs> They are exonucleases which remove nucleotides from the ends of the DNA. That's very important. So nucleases are, uh, they, they remove the nucleotides from the ends of the DNA. Then endonucleases make cuts at specific positions within the DNA. See, if this is the DNA, If this is the DNA, if a specific portion has to be opened or some manipulation has to be done, then endonuclease. Then exonuclease works from the open end. I hope you understand that very clearly. So exonuclease which remove nucleotides from the ends of the DNA. And then the endonuclease which make a cuts at a specific positions within DNA. Then R nucleases, restriction endonucleases, first inspects the length of a DNA sequence. Once it finds its specific recognition sequence, it will bind to the DNA and cut each of the two strands of a double helix at a specific points in their sugar phosphate backbones. See, this is a very interesting thing. First, what it is doing, the nuclease is uh, inspecting. Then, while it is inspecting, which gene it has to or which portion of the DNA 
it has to cut, it makes a survey, it makes a scan, it reads the DNA. After reading it, 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 find, it says that it thinks that a cut has to be made here. So, it is acting in that position. Now, how it is acting or how it is cutting, is this is what we are going to see in the next one. So, our endonucleases first inspects the length of the DNA sequence. Once it finds its specific recognition sequence, it will bind to DNA and cut each of the two strands of a double helix at a specific points in their sugar phosphate backbones. See? This is how the restriction enzyme is acting. <coughs> restriction enzyme. See, this enzyme, it is uh, making a cut. How it is uh, acting? In one, it is a uh, cutting in this uh, position and in another, it is uh, cutting in its uh, position here. Okay? So, this end is uh, called as a sticky end. This is uh, called as a sticky end. Okay? <coughs> this is a more or less a sim similar one, but it's a more clear. That's why I am presenting two uh, photos or two charts for this. This, uh, this is a cutting there, here. And this is a cutting here. And again, this is a cutting here and it is a cutting here. Okay? So the whole thing becomes like this. A stick, these are the sticky ends. And then the sticky ends are um, united by means of what is called the ligases or it's called the ligation. Now, what is this? I, I want to give some information about the palindromic uh, nucleotide. Specific sequence recognized by each or endonucleases is uh, called as a palindromic nucleotide. What is uh, called as a palindromic nucleotide? So, it is uh, what is known as, there are certain palindromic words also, they are there. If I write this word M A L A Y A L A M. Now the name of the this when I pronounce it is called as a Malayalam. It comes as a Malayalam. Now if you read from this end, it is called Malayalam. If you read from this position also, it is called Malayalam. Okay. These are all what are called the palindromic words. Many words are there like that. In English we have got and in Tamil also we have got. In Tamil we have got a word called Vigada Kavi. We have got a Vigada Kavi. Okay. Now if you read from this end it is Vigada Kavi. If you read from this end also it is called Vigada Kavi. Okay. There are so many words. I have got, got the word Tata. The, from this end it is Tata and that end also it is a Tata. This same, so many words are, these words are what are called as palindromic words, are got in all languages. Now, now these words, where, where you see how it is occurring, G is here, G is here, A, 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 T, 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 C, so, from 5 primary end to 3 primary end and from 3 primary end to 5 primary end, this palindromic is uh, repeating and then you have got the. Now, it is uh, this position, the restriction enzymes are able to locate. This is what in my, in my previous slide uh, I was uh, telling you. We used the word uh, inspects. We use the word inspect. So what inspection it is doing? I also use the word uh, scans. It sees uh, where it is. It is completely going through that. So where these uh, I mean, uh, nucleotides are there in the DNA sequence, where this uh, palindromic area is there, it is inspecting. And after inspecting, it is locating this uh, palindromic area or palindromic nucleotides and then now it is a cutting here and here. In this nucleotide it will cut here and in this nucleotide it will cut here. 
So these things will become now the sticky ends. This is what uh, I have shown it uh, very clearly. See, it cuts here and it cuts here. It cuts here and then it cuts here. Now both of them they become the sticky ends and then join together. This can be explained by the word Malayalam, where the groups of letters that form the same word when read from forward and backward. Restriction enzymes cut the strand of a DNA a little away from palindromic sites but between the same two bases on opposite strands. That's very important. But between the same two bases on the opposite strands. What do you mean by that? Same basis on the opposite. Where G is present, where G is present. Cut is made here, cut is made here. That's what we mean by that term. So, they, uh, it, it cuts the strands of a DNA a little away from the palindromic sites, but between the same two bases on opposite strands. This leaves a single standard portion at the ends. This overhanging stitch is called as a sticky end or the of each stand. So, what is this overhanging? This is the overhanging portion. And this is the overhanging portion. Okay? So, when the cut is made, this, these two are called the overhanging portions. So, this overhanging stretch is called as a sticky end on each stand. They form hydrogen bonds with their complementary cut counterparts and stick to each other. This stickiness of the ends facilitates the action of a DNA ligase enzyme or it is simply called as ligases. When cut by same or enzyme restriction enzyme, the resultant DNA fragments of a source have the same kind of sticky ends. That's very important. When the same restriction enzyme is making a cut, then you have got the same kind of sticky ends which can be joined together end to end using the DNA ligases. Then restriction endonucleases and ligases are used in genetic engineering to form recombinant molecules of a DNA which are composed of a DNA from two different sources. This is what we have explained to the top to ex uh, earlier. In the I told you five tools are essential. What are the five tools you remember? Ah, we got it here. These are the five tools. Restriction enzymes and then ligases, polymerases enzymes. So up to this, now it is over. Okay. So, so, or nucleases and then ligases. These two are used in the genetic engineering to form a recombinant molecules of a DNA which are composed of a DNA from two different sources or genomes. Recombinant vectors, second one which was, which was there in that list. Recombinant vectors, molecules cannot be created unless one cuts the vector and the source DNA with the same or nucleases. Now, separation and isolation of a DNA fragments. So, how we, you, we have told you that you have to fragment the DNA molecule. How these fragmentations are done and how these procedures are carried out, we are going to study in a little bit of detail way. The fragments of a DNA resulting from the cutting of a DNA by restriction endonucleases can be separated by a 
टेक्निक नोन एज जेल इलेक्ट्रोफोरोसिस आई होप यू ए लिटिल ए लिटिल बिट ऑफ नॉलेज दैट यू आर हैविंग व्हाट इज नोन एज इलेक्ट्रोफोरोसिस इन केमिस्ट्री वी हैव गॉट अ डिफरेंट टाइप ऑफ सेपरेशन टेक्निक्स ओके यू हैव गॉट सो मेनी सेपरेशन टेक्निक्स आर देयर वेरी 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 फंडामेंटल सेपरेशन टेक्निक दैट एनीबॉडी नोस से यू हैव गॉट अ मिक्सचर ऑफ दैट यू हैव स्टडीड इन योर इन योर 6th क्लास केमिस्ट्री क्लास if you have got an uh, iron filings mixed with the sand or sawdust you can separate it very easily how to separate it you can separate it by, uh, by taking a magnet over it this uh, magnet will uh, mean uh, <coughs> attract all the iron filings and then finally what is left over will be sawdust so it's very easy to separate your uh, sawdust and uh, iron filings with the help of a magnet this is a separation technique so many liquids are being separated by means of what is known as a distillation techniques a distillation techniques are there because uh, the vaporize vaporizing or uh, the point of a vapor a vapor formation will be there will be a broad range will be there one will be getting vaporized at uh, uh, 25 degrees celsius and another one at uh, 35 degrees celsius let us imagine these two liquids can be very easily separated by distillation techniques there are proper chromatography is another method of a separation where you can separate the chlorophyll from the plants so like this you have got so many separation techniques separation technique is a beautiful topic in lab technology okay so different methods we are sieve plates or only a separating you know, what is known as a plates you have got a, a, a granules of a two different sizes and you have got a sieve plate this a sieve plate will be able to separate over the I mean uh, granules with a smaller size so to pass through it the larger ones will stay back at the top of the sieve plate by that you will be able to separate it out similarly by using what is known as a gel what is known as a gel electrophoresis technique we are able to remove the uh, desired dna the separated fragments can be visualized after staining the dna with ethidium bromide followed by exposure to uv radiation this is separated dna appearing as orange colored bands are cut out from the agros gel and extracted from gel piece this step is called as elution elution so you take the uh, you take the chromosomes or you take the dna and then make a cut with the help of the endonucleases but how to remove this uh, cut dna see the dna is you can't handle the dna in in a physical form that's very difficult because they are so 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 microscopic they are molecular structures so you can't handle the dna by your hand so what do you do you take that one and then do the uh, gel electrophoresis and in that gel electrophoresis it will be producing an orange color orange color in uv radiation that orange color portion alone you have to cut and then remove and then that that orange color portion is now containing the dna which you have cut and this process is called as elution these are purified dna fragments are used in constructing recombinant dna by joining them with the cloning vectors so you have to clone it along with the vectors okay plasmids and bacteriophages are used in this technology because of their ability to replicate within the bacterial cells independent of the control of the bacterial chromosome so bacteriophages are high in number their number bacteriophages are high in number while plasmids are one or two per cell plasmids are one or two per cell but sometimes their number goes to 10 to 15 whereas bacteriophages they are very high in number so you can use anything you can use either the bacteriophages 
or you can use the plasmids depending upon the situation. In a particular uh, bacterium, you may be getting a phage particle. Then in that case, you can use the phage. Or a particular bacterium may not have any phage. It may contain only the plasmid. In that case, you are left with another option. You have to take only the plasmid as a vector. So what is suitable for your exper experiment you have to choose? So either you have to choose a bacteriophage or you have to choose a plasmid. It depends on the experiment. And it depends on the gene that you are going to clone. Well, it depends on so many factors. But both the things are used in the laboratories. So you take these uh, plasmids or the bacteriophages and then why you are selecting that because they will be replicating in their own speed. This is a bacterium and it has got a chromosome. Now when the bacterium is dividing at a particular rate, these things will be dividing at a different rate. So they will be having, so they, they have got the ability to replicate within the bacterial cell and it is independent of the bacterial division. Please sir, understand. Okay. So, this is a beautiful diagram showing uh, the transformation. This is the bacterial cell and then when you are transferring it, it is uh, getting incorporated here. It is uh, getting the transferred genes have come here. That can be done with the help of uh, what is known as a micro injection also. In the last slide we will be able to, uh, I will be able to tell where, um, in which stage we are using what technique, it all depends. In plant cell we follow some technique, in animal cells we follow certain techniques. See these uh, different techniques are there, where what we have to use, it all depends upon the situation, the organism, the type of a DNA that we are handing etc. So directly into the nucleus also you can inject the foreign DNA. Once alien DNA is linked to plasmid or bacteriophage, it can be multiplied equal to the copy member number of a plasmids or bacteriophage. Vectors are engineered in such a way that they can help linking of a foreign DNA and selection of a recombinants from non-recombinants. This is very important. So it all depends upon the selection of a recombinant from a non-recombinant. You have to choose which recombinant is uh, suitable for your experiment. A beautiful um, display of uh, how you carry out it. See, you have got your foreign DNA. You make a fragmentation and you see the vector is a cut and uh, in this uh, the cut vector you have introduced uh, this portion which you have got from here. So this vector, it is shown with a green color, blue color, wild color, white. Different genes are shown with different colors. Okay. Then you make a cut. It, it opens out. Then once it is opening out, you induce uh, this foreign DNA here. Now it has become a recombinant plasmid. This is a plasmid. This is a recombinant plasmid because you have recombined a DNA from a foreign DNA. You have put a foreign DNA into this plasmid, so it has become the normal plasmid has become a recombinant plasmid. Competent host for a transformation with our DNA. So very interesting thing. See, you must select a competent host. See, for example, uh, for, for causing a malaria, only a mosquito is a competent uh, vector and you won't get a disease if some other, uh, if the house fly is coming and is sitting on your body, you are not going to get a malaria because only the uh, mosquito, anaphylaxis mosquito, that to your female anaphylaxis mosquito, that only will be able to carry the plasmodium virus and then inject it into your system. So each and every organism in this world has got its own pathogen, its own vector. It's all beautifully related. See, human being means it, he gets a malarial disease. So that itself is very, I mean, very much linked. All the animals in the world will not get a malarial disease. Human being and some other relative mammals, related mammals, we may get it. And for that, yeah, vector is needed. 
what is that it is a uh, plasmodium vivax i mean sorry it is a malarial parasite mosquitoes this mosquito will be only carrying the plasmodium vivax so everything is very specific okay so plasmodium vivax cannot be carried by any other mosquito and any other mosquito will not be able to cause a disease on the human body everything is very specific so competent that's what we mean by the word competent a competent host should be the dna being a hydrophilic molecule cannot pass through the cell membrane so bacterial cells must be first made competent to take up the dna otherwise the, if the competency is not then it will not be able to receive it it will not be able to receive it for receiving it it should have the competency this is done by treating with specific concentration of a divalent cation in the form of the calcium which increases the efficiency with which a dna enters a bacterium through the pores in the cell wall or dna can be forced into the bacteria by incubating them with our dna on ice so this uh, our dna what are the other methods by which it could be put in a bacterium they can be forced into the bacteria by incubating this another taking force into the bacteria by incubating them with our dna on ice followed by placing them on briefly a heat heat shock this method is called as a heat shock method first you put it in the ice then immediately heat it when you do it like that and then putting it back to the ice putting it to the ice then heat it then once again putting it in the ice so by this you will be able to forcefully send the our dna into the bacterium in micro injection method our dna is directly injected into the nucleus of an animal this is the slide which i was showing um about four or five slides back ah see the slide see here it is a micro injected directly into an animal cell if it is going to be an animal cell it can be directly injected in micro injection method the our dna is directly injected into the micro into the nucleus of an animal biolistics another method the biolistics or a gene gun method is suitable for plants so for animals you follow a micro injection method and for plants it is a biolistics so it all depends upon the um, plant or animal which material you are handling in biotechnology so gene gun method is uh, suitable for plants plant cells are bombarded with a high voltage micro particles of a gold or tungsten coated with dna i think uh, i remember to have shown a slide for uh, this also the high voltage is a positive see holding the i'm sorry we don't uh, we don't have i think uh, okay <clears throat> so in the plants we are following the biolistics method and for the animals we are following the micro injection method ah here comes the slide biolistics i thought that it was there somewhere else now this is the micro injection method for the animals and this is the for, this one for the plants okay so the very high voltage it is injected into the plant inflection method in this case disarmed pathogen vector agrobacterium tumefaciens are allowed to infect the cells to transfer our dna into the host cell methods of making the our dna there are three methods transformation phage introduction and non bacterial transformation so disarmed pathogen what do you mean by that disarmed pathogen see you have got a pathogen and this a pathogen it could be a bacterium or it could be a virus it could be anything it could be a fungus 
now that uh, in from that j i mean uh, genes you remove you remove the disease causing genes alone you remove the disease causing genes alone from the genes present in a particular pathogen then that is a beautifully called as a disarmed pathogen it has lost its arms and ammunition it can no more take part in a fight between uh, between it and a human being when it is going along with the arm and ammunition into your body then it can cause any disease it can kill you because it has it is now armed with the, the pathogen pa pa pathogen uh, i mean a disease causing gene but when you have removed that gene it has become completely disarmed so this vector agrobacterium timefishens which is a disarmed or allowed to infect the cells to transfer the or dna see now you take the pathogen you take the agrobacterium timefishens which are causing the diseases in the plants you disarm them and then you inject it then it will not be able to cause any disease okay this method see this agrobacterium timefishens is a ti plasmid and then trna we have already told you that when a ti plasmid ti plasmid is removed it becomes a t dna which is harmless it is harmless it is carrying some of the beneficial genes there it is only this which is causing the uh, uh, galls tumor so it is removed and then this a t dna which is carrying the beneficial gene that alone is taken and then it is injected into the then it is injected into the plant now that is going to be beneficial okay now see this is another beautiful uh, chart this is the agrobacterium tumefaciens it goes like this then this is the ti plasmid this portion is the ti plasmid this is the t dna portion which is uh, carrying the good genes if this uh, ti plasmid is uh, removed then this becomes a uh, gene becomes uh, it is not going to cause any diseases so this is the uh, agrobacterium timefishens this is a bacterial chromosome and this is the plasmid the plasmid is uh, containing two types of genes one is a disease causing gene another one is a i mean uh, not uh, unharmful not harmful genes so this is removed and then you take the t dna alone this t dna is taken and then it is incorporated and then it is put into the plant cell see this infection of a plant cell with t dna alone it has been now removed now first one i told you it is uh, taking place in uh, three steps you remember you remember or was that a slide ah here it is transformation phage introduction and then non bacterial transformation so these are the three steps for making the r dna i explain so the first step this is to select a piece of a dna to be inserted into the vector or the bacterium so this is the first one is the first step is the selection selection of a piece of a dna to be inserted the second step is to cut that piece of a dna first you select it then you cut it with or nucleus the third step is to ligase the dna with a vector and dna ligase See, it is just like it is to be very simple to make it you understand. Very simple. I can use this anomaly. I think very easy to to make you understand. You go to your cloth shop and you want to stitch a shirt. You want to stitch a shirt. What do you do? Of course, you can purchase it directly from the market. Uh, what is on a ready-made. 
but you want to select your own dress material and you want to stitch it so what do you want what are the different steps you are doing you first you select the material dress material that you want to stitch you want to make a shirt first is selection second one is a cut it into pieces give it to a tailor he will cut it into pieces you can do it if you do it the job of a tailor then uh, your shirt will not be a shirt okay so you give it to a tailor he will cut it into the different uh, pieces and then he will lay lay gaze it he will stitch it he will join it to make it into a beautiful uh, I mean shirt or a pant um, uh, according to your need and your desire the same thing that you are carrying out here also you select a piece of a dna and then you cut that into pieces and then you lay gate it you lay gate it it's lay gate and then the dna is set into the vector now this becomes a uh, beautiful the insert contains a selectable dna molecule antibiotic markers in the insert or dna when present the host with vector leaves because it is resistant whereas the host cell without vector dies because of the absence of the selectable marker so you have to do it with the help of a marker in transformation vector with or dna is inserted or introduced into a cell host host cells must be prepared for taking up a foreign dna that's very important that should be ready to take up a foreign dna even your body it will be offering a I mean, total resistance to accept any foreign material that is why when you are try I mean um, Uh, when you are in a bed and then you have to take uh, blood from some other people see the the blood that you are having is very similar to the blood that someone is having why not the any blood cannot be transferred to you it is not possible the compatibility should be there okay all the things will not become compatible similarly your your cell should be your body system should be able to accept certain things See, host cells must be prepared for taking a foreign DNA. See, only if that foreign DNA is rejected, then nothing could be done. It should become a part and parcel of the receiving organism. That should be able to do that. If that a receiving organism is not able to accept that, then the the whole experiment cannot be done. Okay. So, host cells must be prepared for uh, taking the foreign DNA. This is a very important step in the biotechnology. Selectable markers can be antibiotic resistance, color difference, or any other character characteristic which can distinguish a transformed host from the non-transformed ones. Okay. So, you can use the markers. Which are all the markers? Antibiotic resistance could be a marker, and then color difference could be a marker. or any other character any other character you can mark it all uh, depends on your experiment of course second one is a phage introduction it is a process of a transfection just like a transformation transduction you got a transformation transfection equivalent to the transformation except a phage is used instead of a bacterium okay here you are using a phage in vitro packaging of a vector is used this uses lambda or m13 phages to produce phage plaques which contain recombinants recombinants that are created can be identified by the difference in the recombinants and non recombinants using selectable markers perhaps the last slide in our discussion today the last one is a non bacterial transformation what's a non bacterial transformation see very it is a very similar to the bacterial transformation very similar to bacterial transformation only difference is that is this is a non bacterial and doesn't use the bacteria in this process micro injection if you, if you are not going to use a, a bacteria for injection then what will you do it's called a micro injection 
This is what we have already discussed earlier. It is called as a biolistics. In this process, microinjection DNA is injected directly into the nucleus of a cell being transformed. And in biolistics, another method, cells are bombarded with a high velocity called microprojectiles, such as a particles of a gold and tungsten that have been created with DNA. So these are all some of the non-bacterial transformations. When you are uh, uh, transferring a portion of the DNA into another organism, you can use a plasmid as a vector, a bacteria could be a vector, a virus could be a vector, a bacteriophage could be a vector, anything could be a transporter. But it can be directly also injected by means of what is called a micro injection or high voltage micro projectiles. These are all some more methods by which a desired gene can be directly bombarded into the uh, desired organism where you want these genes to be incorporated okay fine that's good now we have uh, now in my today's class i was able to give you a very brief idea about uh, this uh, recombinant dna technology how a uh, recombinant dna could be produced so a portion of the dna is uh, cut and then how this is cut it is a cut by means of what is known as the nucleases which are of uh, two types namely the exonuclease and endonucleases and then it is uh, incorporated into a vector then it is uh, transferred to an organism where these uh, genes are required of course so the joining of the cut ends are uh, ligated so the, the, the dna which has uh, taken a portion of the dna from some other organism is uh, called as an uh, r dna because now it is uh, it has it, it is containing the actually it is a uh, dna of uh, two organisms one belonging to the original one and another one the transferred one okay fine so this is what is called as a recombinant dna technology which is a, uh, which is another part of what is called as a biotechnology and in a few more lectures we will be able to i will be able to throw more light on other aspects of biotechnology thank you very much for hearing nice